Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. Happy Monday. It's April 22nd. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com. In another sunny day here in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the best practices of technical analysis. StockCharts was uh, launched about 25 years ago to empower individual investors to better understand the markets using this language of technical analysis. What I love about technical analysis, having used it for a couple years here, uh, is that it is a window into investor psychology. It's tough to figure out what investors are thinking, what they're excited about, what they're nervous about. But the beauty of technical analysis is it's focused on price action. Price is arguably one of the best reflections of investor decision making, of investor behavior. When investors are nervous or excited or upset or panicked or uh, optimistic, arguably price action reflects all of that. And all of the technical tools that we use, all of the statistical analysis, all of that stuff, measures of momentum and price and trend and everything, is just a way of quantifying investor behavior. So let's get into some of the details today and focus on uh, what lessons we learned as we get into our market recap. Before we bring up some of the charts, and share with you some of the insights we're pulling out of uh, today's price action. Do you want to start with a poll that we had recently on our social media accounts? Which equity benchmark do you think performs best over the next month? You've got about four weeks here. Large, mid, or small? Two-thirds of you saying large caps, the SPY. What I, uh, I would probably agree, although this is a tough one, because to be honest with you, one month is a tough window. And that's what I would say. You could make an argument that if certain types of sectors do well from mid-April to mid-May, something like small caps actually do remarkably well. For example, if it's regional banks and things like that that start to improve a lot more, those are the ones that uh, are going to do better. And those are much heavier weighted in the small caps. I think the real point of this sort of question isn't to crystal ball, uh, you know, have a crystal ball in front of you and you know, get it right, although it's fun to be right about what the markets are going to do. It's really to go through a thoughtful exercise. How do you analyze those three uh, sort of what I call cap tiers, large caps, mid caps, small caps? Can you think about the construction of those indexes? Think about what types of names are more uh, reflected in the small cap indexes, things like financials, maybe energy, maybe materials. Which ones are much more uh, accentuated in the large cap indexes like the S&P and the NASDAQ, things like technology and communication services. Recognizing that it's not just a ticker, but it's actually made of a bunch of individual stocks grouped together in sectors that tend to have thematic plays on their own. That's how you get to that sort of next level, a nice sort of meta level of understanding uh, different benchmarks and, uh, and how they operate. So. Hopefully, stock charts can be part of that way that you're able to answer that question effectively. By the way, don't forget to follow us on all your socials so you won't miss the next uh, poll question. Let's get to how the markets played out through the course of the day today. Not a bad day, to be honest with you. The last hour and a half was a little bit of a distribution. The S&P got all the way almost to 50-40, so not quite to that 50-50 level, which was our line in the sand coming down. We didn't quite get there, but we did have a meaningful recovery after last week. I mean, I think four of the five days last week were just sort of drifting lower, if not aggressively moving lower. So today with a nice counter trend move to the upside, I think is pretty encouraging. We ended the day around 50-10. That's about 0.9% uh, higher. Now, if you, if you caught my uh, vernacular there, my language, what I described it as a counter trend rally. And I do believe that's sort of what we're in here. I think a lot of people are using the uh, hopium strategy, hoping this is the beginning of a nice recovery higher. It certainly could be. I've been wrong many times before, but given the destruction, given the deterioration that we've seen, given the breadth conditions, which have gotten a lot worse, uh, I would argue that this feels much more like that initial bounce after that big initial sell-off. feels like we might have uh, further downside to be had. And what's interesting is in the last hour, even though we've had that nice rally, look at how investors are selling off on the rally in the afternoon. So going into the close, that's usually more institutions unwinding, uh, unwinding positions going into the uh, end of the trading day. Usually not a great sign. You'd like to see uh, the market move higher in the last 30 to 60 minutes. The Nasdaq Composite, by the way, up over 1% to 15,451. We'll call it mid caps and small caps all up as well. To be honest, no real differentiation. Think about it, thinking about our poll question, certain days it's large over small, small over large. There's like a very clear divergence or a, a, um, a disagreement where certain types of stocks within those cap tiers are doing better than others. Today, they're all kind of the same, all around 0.8, 0.9% higher. The VIX actually moving lower and actually closed in a 16 handle, which means 
just below 17, around 16.9. That's down almost two full VIX points from where we were on Friday. I think one of the big themes that we've observed here in the month of April has been a dramatic increase in uh, volatility, right? VIX is still between that 15 and 20 level, which is arguably still, you know, still low volatility compared to historical averages. But getting above 15 means we're in that pullback range. And I would say uh, closing the day around 17, we're still sort of almost dead center in the middle of that, uh, of that range here. So still telling me pullback of VIX above 20 is a, uh, is a big alert that I like to uh, keep an eye on. That's where it tells you that volatility is becoming um, more of a high volatility environment, more of an extreme volatility move. Big sell-offs tend to be marked by the VIX popping above uh, 20. So if you're still all bulled up, if you still see this as a viable pullback, I would say the VIX hovering around 17 probably helps that case. VIX above 20, I would very much start to question that uh, particular idea. Looking at the interest rate environment, honestly, no real change from uh, Friday's close. 10-year, 5-year, 30-year points, pretty similar, so I won't waste any more time telling you. They're all slightly higher, but this is more of a rounding error. Bonds slightly lower. The dollar, uh, you know, about the same, so not a significant move anyway. And, you know, it's interesting as interest rates are sort of uh, choppy here. No real economic data coming out today, but through the course of the week, we do have a couple uh, economic numbers uh, coming out. This week in particular, it's about earnings. A half of the magnificent seven names are reporting through the course of this week. That's where a lot of people would be focused. I would encourage you to be focused there uh, as well. Quite a bit of movement in the commodity space. We've been talking about that resurgent in commodities. And on, I think it was Thursday's show of last week, we had a great conversation with Tyler Wood of Go No Go Charts, talking about the um, you know resurgence of the commodity space. He actually showed uh, using their methodology from Go No Go Charts how uh, a lot of the commodity relative strength uh, and commodity re related stocks, I should say, different ETFs covering uh, commodity uh, uh, led stocks had all rotated from underperforming to outperforming using their methodology. So interesting to note today, a counter move to that gold actually moving lower, the GLD down two and a half percent, silver almost five percent lower, copper holding steady, crude oil not too much difference, but precious metals in particular, rotating to the, uh, to the downside. So it's interesting what we've seen is, uh, you know, in the last three to four weeks, growth stocks coming off, they actually had a nice counter trend move higher today. Uh, precious metals moving higher, they had a counter trend move uh, lower. Wondering this is a bit of a mean reversion before we go back to that uh, sort of initial acceleration that we uh, saw off of the market top and the rally in gold. Perhaps we'll keep an eye on the chart to uh, track that. Bitcoin having now, we're sort of uh, right in the midst as we now see what happens after that momentous occasion. Bitcoin currently just above 66,500. That's up about 2.4%. Again, uh, Bitcoin trades over the weekend uh, along with the other cryptocurrencies. So saying 2.4%, it's kind of from an arbitrary mark of uh, point in time on Sunday for, uh, for us here, uh, uh, if you're on the Eastern time zone and Pacific time zone in the U.S., uh, but uh, for what it's worth, Bitcoin currently trending higher, just below 67,000 Ether prices, just below 3,200. And all five of the uh, top coins that we track in the green at this particular moment. Looking at the 11 S&P sectors, you can see financials, number one, up 1.2%. We're kind of coming out of the bulk of financials uh, reporting. A lot of banks, uh, and last week a lot of regional banks reported. We do have some um, coming through today into tomorrow. Truist, TFC, Zion's. Uh, a bank, a couple of regional banks are, uh, are coming out here. So we'll take a look at those charts later in the market recap if we can. Look at this consumer staples number two. One of the uh, patterns that we highlighted, I think, on Thursday's show, might have been over the weekend as I'm thinking about it, to my uh, market misbehavior premium members, talked about how uh, defense has been outperforming offense more and more. Staples, consumer staples had not been particularly strong on a relative basis. You're starting to see that pop up a little more. And last week, Staples actually really started to outperform consumer discretionary. Today, continuing to press that trade with the XLP up uh, about a full percent from yesterday. Utilities, number three, and all of those edging out technology, which was number four. You can see all 11 of the S&P sectors were higher, but lagging behind today, you have materials and communication services, both up slightly from Friday's close. Healthcare uh, up about 0.4% uh, from, uh, from Friday. Looking at the uh, what we call the Magnificent Seven, and thanks, guys. I'm getting some. I'm getting better and better ideas here in terms of uh, some different things to work with. Oh, I should have jotted some of these down. Um, let's see. The uh, what was it? The something Quattro. I'm gonna have to. Rem I'm gonna have to go back. Maybe tomorrow I'll be better prepared with some of the alternative names. But I'm looking for some names for this new way of referring to the leadership in the mega cap growth space. So keep the ideas coming. It's about four names here. So. Fab Four, the final four, 
Uh, a lot of those have come up. I had some really interesting ones, though, over the weekend I was uh, jotting down. So I'll, uh, I'll come up with some better terms uh, tomorrow. But keep the ideas coming. NVIDIA, for what it's worth, actually popping higher today, up over 4% far outpacing the rest of this group. You can see Amazon and Alphabet are both up 1.4%. Uh, Alphabet is going to be one of those names. I think they're Thursday after the close, if I remember right, um, uh, up 1.4%. Boy, those are pivotal earnings here with Alphabet, Microsoft, Tesla, Meta, all reporting over the next couple sessions. Speaking of uh, weak charts that keep getting weaker, we'll jump to Tesla here, continuing to push to the downside. It's so funny. I mean, all I feel like all the way down, Someone at some point has written me and said, you know, implying either is this the time to buy Tesla or saying I bought Tesla and here's why. And I will tell you what I have told every single one of them. When a stock is going lower and making lower lows and lower highs, when a stock is trending below two downward sloping moving averages and when the RSI never gets above 50, I have learned those are not great charts. <laughs> those are, and, and that is not a judgment call. That is a factual assessment of what these things are telling I me. Mean, think about what it means when a stock keeps making new lows below a downward sloping 50-day moving average, below a downward sloping 200-day moving average. That means the price is going down over different time frames. That means we're not seeing buyers come in in any meaningful way. You're not seeing signs of accumulation. Someone had asked about Brian Shannon of uh, Alpha Trends. He mentioned something, and I forget what it was. It was something like, I don't buy support. I buy when a stock moves away from support or something I'm Sorry, Brian, I'm paraphrasing, I think, a very well-articulated quote that I just butchered. But it was something about don't, you know, pick a point and buy it. You know, buy something when you see a sign that it rotates higher. And I always talk about signs of accumulation. That's my way of referring to that similar phenomenon. Just because something hits a certain price level on its own, that's not enough for me. I want to see signs that someone else thinks this is a good idea before I do. Otherwise, you're buying a falling knife. You're buying all the way down. And if you bought Tesla at 190 and 170, and 160, and 150, and now 140. Eventually, you may be proven right, but you're losing a lot right at the beginning. I'd much rather sort of be patient and own things that are going up until I see Tesla as an actionable opportunity. And again, I'm just not seeing that uh, just yet today. So things I would look for, we stop going down, number one. We stop making new 52-week lows. That would help. Um, we see signs of a rotation higher. We start to see some bullish candle patterns, for example. RSI gets about 50. That would actually be really encouraging because that would tell you something's different. We're actually seeing uh, the, uh, the thing push higher. and The relative strength is, again, trending lower. So stocks like Tesla, I think the chart is telling you not the right time. Let's wait for it to, uh, to be the right time. Let's go. Uh, sorry for going down a Tesla rabbit hole, but it was top of mind here as I'm thinking about names coming up and reporting earnings through the, uh, the course of the week here. Daily chart of the S&P, it's almost following a perfect script, and I don't want to you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of saying here's what the market's going to do and kind of crudely drawing a uh, set of waves that I think is probably going to happen. But I would tell you that, um, you know, for now, it seems it might be following that classic playbook of breaking down through a key level. For me, 50-50 was the level for the S&P, remains an important level. Now, all of a sudden, we're bouncing back up to it. And, you know, end of last week, one of the things we talked about was, you know, when you have a market coming off like this, it is totally normal that you get a bounce higher. And, and it will feel like, a very tempting rally, and maybe this is where we retest uh, the previous highs and go higher. It's really way too premature to making that uh, sort of claim, but bear market rallies happen often. I mean, some of the biggest up days you'll ever see are in bear markets. So the question is, do we make higher highs and higher lows? And so, you know, initially closing back above 50-50 would at least tell me something's changing. Uh, for now, I see this as more weaker uh, than stronger. I do want to sh show the uh, chart of gold here very quickly. Um, just to uh, indicate, of course, it has, has come off quite a bit today. We can look at SPOC gold. We're actually going to look at the GLD just because there was this gap lower today. GLD is an ETF that tracks uh, spot gold, so it really does own physical gold. It's more of a direct bet on gold. You're not looking at gold stocks like the GDX. This is really playing on the commodity. You can see we came down. End of last week, we closed around 222. Today, we're down uh, around 215, 260. It's down about 2.5%. So it's not the end of the world. And we're actually still holding this swing low from uh, a couple weeks ago. In, uh, in mid-April, but all of a sudden looking a little bit vulnerable. So higher lows are a good thing. You know, breaking down through support, less good. So let's keep an eye on gold, particularly as we have a bunch of growth stocks reporting earnings. Maybe that could uh, shuffle some things around a little bit. Boy, we have a lot of stocks reporting earnings this week, and this is the, the meat of earnings season, so I, I can never get to all the names I, I'd like to. 
just to highlight things on the move, I would encourage you to use our earnings calendar to be well prepared for things. But I just want to highlight some of the ones that I think are compelling and or actionable. This is a stock Verizon, which I'm sure you're focused uh, or familiar with. I want to highlight what's called a bearish engulfing pattern. This is a candle chart showing Friday's up close, where the uh, open candle shows you the opens at the bottom, the closes up here. We had a much higher open and a much lower close. That is a distributive pattern to a candle pattern called a bearish engulfing pattern. The last time we had one of these, by the way, was that for now the top, right? Uh, first week in April, we had that up day followed by a down day. Down day engulfs the range of the first day. We had the exact same thing today, but even more exaggerated because we opened way up here and closed way at the low. So not a great read on uh, Verizon here. ACI is uh, Albertsons, sort of a concerning one, uh, an earnings name uh, this week. And you can see that we're testing uh, support right around $20 a share. Big round number, also where we found support at the end of February, uh, beginning of March. I men mentioned how consumer staples are starting to outperform. It's not as much food retailers like ACI, which have been struggling a little bit, most recently making a lower high just above the 50-day moving average. Now we're testing support. Now, if this holds at 20 and it becomes a double bottom pattern and maybe makes a bit of a bullish engulfing, or excuse me, a, a bullish divergence, could be really encouraging, but we have to hold 21st. And today we're kind of pushing right back toward that level. So I would keep an eye, uh, eye on that one. We had a lot of banks reporting last week, but I do want to highlight two of them. Truist, this is a regional bank that was formed, it was a couple years ago, it was um, ooh, bb and and uh, SunTrust, I want to say, uh, merged a little while ago and made uh, what's called Truist. Uh, you know, looking at the chart of Truist, you can see we've been sideways, and I think earnings, you know, uh, could certainly propel the stock higher. We're up about 3.4%. This sort of chart, in my opinion, is encouraging. If we break out of that base, uh, we're not quite there. Zion's Bank, another one sort of in that same uh, group of regional banks. Again, sort of still in a consolidation mode. Uh, higher lows, lower highs. You want to see a break out of that range. Not quite doing it. Just to finish off, after the close today, we have Nucor, N-U-E. The reason why I want to highlight this, this is one of the stocks that actually still looks quite constructive, right? Look at the evidence. Higher highs and higher lows above an upward sloping 50-day and 200-day moving average. We've had a number of pullbacks to the 50-day as we're testing over the last week. Previous pullbacks have been incredibly viable and have led to new swing highs afterwards. The RSI is, uh, is consistently finding a low just above 40. So overall, this appears to be setting up quite well. Now, earnings are happening right after the close today. Love to see if this can uh, cement a higher low, maybe move the next, uh, the next wave higher. That's it for our market recap. Again, a lot of earnings coming up through the course of the week, including four of the big ones, Tesla, Meta, Microsoft, Alphabet, all coming up over the next three trading days. So make sure you analyze those charts ahead of time as I've had some of my conversations uh, and as I will with guests this week. We'll uh, hope do our best to uh, break down those charts for you. A couple quick announcements before we continue on the show with a uh, breadth-focused segment. First off is to contact us. We appreciate so much all the great questions you've sent in uh, over the years here, and we would uh, love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag show. Friday of this week, we'll be doing an all-mailbag episode. We'd love to answer your question on the air. Email is always best, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com on X. Just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV on YouTube here. Just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We appreciate so much your comments and your feedback and very much your questions. Speaking of breadth conditions, I can think uh, my, our segment here in a bit is going to be a bit of a preview for a webcast I'll be doing tomorrow on Tuesday, April 23rd, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'll be doing a special uh, webcast with market misbehavior called Breaking Down Breadth. That is a double entendre, if you will, uh, breaking down as in we're going to break down the components of breadth indicators, breaking down as in they've all gotten kind of bearish here in the last month or so. I'll show you how the current breadth conditions line up to previous market tops and how that can help inform our thinking about the overall conditions. To sign up for that free event, go to marketmisbehavior.com slash breadth. Also, happy birthday to Stock Charts. About 25 years ago, our founder, Chip Anderson, bought the domain stockcharts.com and hand designed this website, which has evolved beautifully over the years, but still stays true to his original goals of empowering investors to make better decisions. This is a beautiful time. We're offering a 25th anniversary sale. You can get up to two months free if you sign up for a, a new account today. And by the way, if you're a member, though, a current member now, and you want to extend your membership, you actually get an even better deal. So make sure you scan the QR code on your screen or go to stockcharts.com special 
If you have never been a Stock Charts member, this is a really good time to do it. We don't do these kind of specials randomly very often. I'm super excited that we are. It's a really good time to test out the real powerful capabilities that we have available to you. And uh, if you're a current member, again, no better time to extend your membership even further. Let's continue on our show today with the next segment called Banking on Breadth. You know, one of the things we like to do is look at breadth indicators. It's a key part of our toolkit, helps us think about the market conditions and uh, how they're evolving. And as I'm bringing up my Mindful Investor Live chart list, I'll show you, I mean, this is just a list of charts that I uh, have oriented. And just so you follow along, this is the, the order of charts that I go through every morning. And then after this, I start looking at a bunch of other things. That's sort of my, my general approach to charting. It starts with a weekly chart of the S&P, a daily chart of the S&P, and then a bunch of other things trying to help me understand the market conditions. I look at some other asset classes, and then I very quickly get into a bunch of breadth indicators. And I've learned over the years, working with people like Phil Roth and Ralph Akampura and others, that breadth indicators tell you so much about the conditions that are not as reflected in the major averages. A lot of times there will be differences where the market, as defined by the S&P or the NASDAQ, is doing one thing, breadth conditions do something different. The breadth is usually right. I just want to focus in on one or two of these charts. And again, if this sort of thinking is of interest to you, I hope you join me for uh, my, uh, my uh, special webinar tomorrow, where I have a little more time to go through these in, uh, in detail. But one of the things I want to highlight was just new 52-week highs and new 52-week lows. So why is this a breadth indicator that we look at? So to start with, we uh, at the top have the S&P 500 going back for the last uh, 12 months. We have the 50 and 200 day moving averages at the bottom. We have the net difference of new 52 week highs minus new 52 week lows. So if the bars are black, that means we have way more new highs than new lows. If the bars are red, the histogram here, that means new lows are outnumbering new highs. Think of it as a basic stoplight, right? Are more stocks going up or going down? That's the simple assessment. In bull market phases, tends to be more stocks going up than down, right? Because plenty of big names are probably leading higher. Not just big names, but other stocks, right, are actually usually performing quite well. That's what propels the benchmarks higher. When the benchmarks go into a corrective phase, you can see the black goes away. We see red histogram, uh, the red histogram uh, fires up. And what that tells you is all of a sudden stocks are making new 52 week lows. And enough of that happens, it really creates more of a sustained decline, which is what we saw uh, August, September, October of last year. Below there, we have the new 52 week highs and new 52 week lows on the New York Stock Exchange at the very bottom, that same look for the S&P 500. You'll notice these two bottom series are very, very similar. There's usually not a lot of difference uh, between those two, to be honest with you. Um, on some charts, you get a lot of differences between different groups of stocks. I would say with this particular chart and this particular combination, there's not a ton of discrepancy between the two occasionally, which is why I have them both, uh, both on here. But it's more just to understand the types of names or, or really the number of names uh, that are uh, breaking out or breaking down. So why do we track 52-week highs and 52-week lows? Well, the time frame 52 weeks is just an easy to remember. It's a year, right? So stock making a new high for the year is usually pretty important. That means something is breaking out in some way. Stocks making the lowest point that it has in the last 12 months usually is pretty meaningful as well. So this is clearly just tracking not everything, but the names moving to extreme highs or extreme lows, the ones really leading the way upwards and downwards. So what happens is when you have a major market low like you do in October, let's start there. After there, we had about a week later, all of a sudden it looked pretty encouraging, right? Because we bounced higher. About a week after that, we'd broken above the 200-day moving average. A week after that, we'd had another gap in early November, and it really felt like the all clear, like this market was going higher. We quickly broke above the July high and in many ways didn't look back until the end of March as we continue to see a resilient move higher to the upside. But look at the histograms at the bottom and you can see this rotation from kind of everything going down and almost nothing making a new high to all of a sudden you start to see new 52 week lows evaporate because this negative sentiment that had been pushing the markets lower all of a sudden started to dissipate and stocks weren't being sold off, stocks were being bought off of those lows. As a result, when the S&P's up here, it's obviously no longer making a new 52 week low most stocks, kind of the same thing happening. So all of a sudden you have an equal number of new highs and new lows on the New York Stock Exchange for about a week. Then look what happens as more and more leadership names are quickly recovering off the October low and making new 52 week highs. Then you see a green histogram getting bigger and bigger. You see almost very few to no uh, uh, red uh, numbers on there and that's tracking again the number uh, every day 
of stocks making new 52 week lows. Most stocks aren't going down anymore. And as a result, it's enough for the market to go higher. So when a lot of things are making new highs and almost nothing's making a new low, it makes sense intuitively that the market's going higher. Now, let's look at what's happened in the last month, and you will see why I have this chart on my Mindful Investor Live chart list. When you have a market in a rally phase, and then you get to the end of the move, what tends to happen? Well, often what will happen is the market uh, in the form of the benchmarks will roll over a little bit. You will still see some green uh, represented here because not everything, it's not like everything, all investors get together and say, okay, today's the day, let's all start selling. There are a lot of different people doing a lot of different things, motivated by different uh, uh, it, it, information. And as a result, different stocks start to sell off a little more aggressively than others. <clears throat> but you still have some names uh, you know, continuing to move higher. So certain names, in this case, probably some of the larger names are rolling over. As a result, the benchmarks are coming off, but you still have stocks making new 52-week highs. What happens as a decline continues and maybe gets more matured after a week or two, all of a sudden you start to see the green histogram go away because there's enough of a risk-off mentality. If you start to get nervous about the market going lower, maybe you initially take some bets off the table, but you're hesitating because you're not sure how bad it's going to be. Then when things start to break down, you go, okay, wait, this is something legitimate. I really need to unwind positions. And so all that stuff that had been leading higher all of a sudden no longer is going up anymore also. And now we get into full risk off mode where investors are selling rather than buying. And then it leads back to what we saw in July and August. So look at the similarities from March, April of this year to what we saw in kind of like July, August, September of last year. And again, not perfect. These are not the same moves by any means, but you can see what happens, right? A bunch of new 52 week highs, the market tops out in late July, we start to sell off. There's still plenty of green, but just a little bit less. And then all of a sudden, very soon, there's very little to no green, and you see a bunch of red pile up here. And that's even when the S&P is well above its own 52-week low, but some of those early droppers, those ones that are really showing weakness, quickly get to a new 52-week low. The concern I have for the market here in April into May of 2024 is that this is just the beginning. What if we're in that sort of mid-August point? We had the breakdown of the 50-day. We've seen new lows now starting to un outnumber new highs. We've seen an evaporation in new 52-week highs. We're now starting to see an increase in new 52-week lows. We actually had a couple counter trend bounces, but there was enough negativity here and a lack of buying power that it really created a sustained decline. What would look different here is if you see red get lessened and green increase, which would mean at least some things are starting to be a bit higher and, uh, and push to the upside. So this is one particular breadth indicator uh, looking at new 52-week highs and lows. That was a walkthrough of how it's constructed, thinking about the movements in the benchmark versus the number of stocks actually pushing higher. And this is all about leadership. In any environment, you're going to have stocks going up or going down. But by aggregating that into a, an equal weighted number, a count of stocks making new 52-week highs and lows, you get a much better sense of whether there's something actionable there uh, to, uh, to be worth following. By the way, if this was interesting and you want a little more of it, go to uh, marketmisbehavior.com slash breath. Hope you join me for my free webcast tomorrow. That's it, folks. That's a wrap for this show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. I'm Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks so much, as always, for watching. Be safe, be well, stay safe, and have a great night. Bye now.